in Henley on Thames. <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming and for standing in the rain, you warriors, you. Um, Stephen asked me to talk about several things, and some of them um, I can talk about, such as what's going on in other countries. Um, but I'd like to start off with what's going on in our own country which for me was a real shock when I think it was Thursday morning and I woke up only to hear that our Prime Minister had said something along the lines of we need to open a debate on mandatory injections. Now I don't know about you, but I felt that my life was then threatened. Did you feel your life was threatened? Because as we know, people are dying from these injections and they're ending up with serious injuries and we actually don't know what the death toll is or what the injury toll is but what we know is that there is a risk and it's a risk to each of us as individuals so the idea of mandating an experimental medical treatment is absolutely criminal so there is no debate it goes against our criminal law offences against the person act in, uh, inflicting bodily injury with intent. That's only lawful if you've given your lawful consent to be injected. If you haven't, then it's a crime. Okay, so the idea that our Prime Minister can go public and say we need to debate this is outrageous. Yeah. And I just want to cite a bit of criminal uh, case law for you. Would you mind holding that piece? <laughs> so I can be my lovely assistant here. So here's a bit of our case law on forced injections. This is Lady Hale in the Supreme Court decision of R. Wilkinson against Broadmoor Hospital in 2001. Okay, forcible measures inflicted upon an incapacitated patient, which are not a medical necessity, may indeed be inhumane or degrading. The same must apply to forcible measures inflicted upon a capacitated patient. In other words, someone with full capacity. The people who carry out such assaults, you know she uses the term assault because it is, and in particular, the responsible medical officer who requires it to be done may be sued in the ordinary way for the tort of battery. The fact that those responsible are exercising statutory powers makes no difference. Now, our Prime Minister needs to read that case law. That's R.M. Wilkinson versus Broadmoor Hospital, 2001. And another case law, duress. This is cited in the case of Harani against Harani, 1982. Duress, whatever form it takes, is a coercion of the will so as to vitiate consent. In other words, if you only consent under duress, which clearly a mandate would be, your consent is not lawful. Therefore, the crime of battery and assault would have been committed on you. And further, the executive government cannot change law made by Act of Parliament, nor the common law. The Act of Parliament is Offences Against the Person Act 1861, which specifically prohibits being assaulted. And by the way, you can't consent to being grievous bodily harmed or murdered in this jurisdiction. And nor can they change the common law. And our common law says that you don't get to go around murdering each other or assaulting each other. So those are three very powerful cases that I invite our Prime Minister to read. There is no debate on this. Well done. Yes. Now, as you've also heard, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the uh, President of the European Commission, has talked about setting aside the Nuremberg Code. My immediate thought was, who the hell does Ursula von der Leyen think she is? A Nazi. Right? <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because the reality yeah. is that we didn't go through the two world wars and the horrific Nuremberg trials that were held at the end of the Second World War, in which the doctors and nurses and the medics were held to account, and some of them were imprisoned, and some of them, when found guilty, the death penalty applied because they'd killed so many people. 
those doctors and medics were held to account for all the people that they've experimented on or given medical treatment without consent. Now the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, under international humanitarian law, we have the inalienable, fundamental, inviolable right to life. No one gets to take that away from you. The only two lawful occasions that your right to life can be taken is one, if a death sentence is passed down in accordance with the criminal code in a properly convened court in a nation that allows for the death sentence. That's one time that the nation can derogate from your right to life. The second time is if it's in a lawful act of war between two armed combatants. And even then, the four fundamental principles of warfare apply, which is military necessity, which requires you to disable, not kill. You're to complete your mission with a minimum amount of loss of people and buildings. And for those of you who don't know, I'm a retired army officer, and I stand here with one of my fellow vets, so I can talk with authority about the rules of lawfare. The second principle is humanity. Now, under the war conventions, you don't even get to give medical treatment or experiment on your enemy prisoners of war. Okay? Let alone for your boss to decide that it's okay, or the school, or your own government, or our own prime minister. You don't get to do that under the war, rape, war conventions, even to your prisoners of war. And indeed, if you do give them medical treatment, it has to be certified. And if they die, there has to be a full inquest. We're being denied that in times of peace, and we're non-armed combatants. And you don't get to derogate from the right to life, even in a public health emergency. And you'll see from the, all the international human rights instruments, the right to life is enshrined in every single one of them. And none of them give a, a state the power to derogate from that. Also, you have the right not to be tortured or to be given cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Again, that's enshrined in all the international um, conventions, in the European Convention on Human Rights, in the Human Rights Act, and indeed in our own Magna Carta, 1297. And what that says is that, you know, because we have a right to life, if you torture someone, or you give them cruel or inhumane degrading treatment, they might die, so that threatens the right to life. Now the European Court ruled in a case called Pretty against the United Kingdom, 2002 I think it was, that giving medical treatment without consent amounts to cruel, inhumane degrading treatment. Because of course it does. We have the absolute fundamental sovereignty over our body and mind. And indeed, that's enshrined in our common law, in a Latin maxim, because we've had it since the Justinian Code, the Romans who came to us 1,500 years ago, voluntas et gratis suprema lex, over his or her, her own mind or body, the individual is sovereign. So nobody has the right to tell you, don't worry, nobody has the right to tell you to take one of these injections, let alone our Prime Minister open a debate on the issue. Now, do, do I have any feedback on that? How do you all feel about what I've just said? Were you aware that you had those inalienable rights? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been yeah. Am I repeating myself? <laughs> so, one of the things that I've found on my talks and going out on the rallies is this that the vast majority of people don't seem to know their rights other than what they've heard from me talking about them on videos. Is that right? Is that where you've heard yes, that? Yes, people don't know. Which begs the question, doesn't it? How many of you were taught about your human rights and the law and the constitution at school? No. Zero. None of you. We're taught about the right. UN. Talk about what? We were taught about the UN. Oh, the UN. <laughs> so... <laughs> Exactly that. We are governed by consent. We do not live in a dictatorship. 
I, I, I don't know if that's news to you, but we're governed by consent. If you actually look at the coronation oath, the Queen swears to uphold to the utmost of her power our laws. And of those laws that are cited, it says the statutes as agreed upon. Because, you know, under our constitution, if it works correctly, our MPs are truly representing us, and therefore if they pass any acts of Parliament, any laws in Parliament, it's because it's been fully debated, there have been lots of working parties, it's gone back and forth between the opposition and the Houses, and by the time Our Majesty signs it, everybody's in agreement that it's a great idea. However, that's not the situation we've got. We've got acts of Parliament and regulations, statutory instruments, that are just being handed down under essentially a diktat because there is no debate going on between the opposition and the party. And when you actually read the debates that record the debates in Hansard, you'll see that, for example, Matt Hancock in the second reading of the Coronavirus Act said it's taken us months to draft this. <laughs> Now, it would take months to draft it, because it's a 329-page complex bit of law, and I can tell you as a lawyer, that would just do my head in. That doesn't take a few days to draft, right? Which begs the question why they had it already drafted, given that apparently we didn't know anything about this until about January. So it raises questions, but indeed it also raises questions, because the evidence we have is that most MPs were given that draft bill pretty much on the day they were debating it. Now how can you yeah. debate and read and consider the provisions of this document if you're only just handed it? And also, these MPs are not lawyers. So who is advising them on the law so that they can be sure that they are upholding our rule of law as they are duty bound and constitutionally bound to do? Because the evidence is showing that an awful lot of the MPs have no idea about our rule of law. If they did, they would not be saying such things as it's okay to create medical segregation in our society, apartheid. Under the war conventions, that's another crime. Okay? It's also a crime to run a terror campaign on people because that breaches your psychiatric integrity. So here we have a government who is making laws that they're not entitled to do, setting aside our common law. I've just read you the case. They're using coercion, which is a crime. They're threatening people with the loss of their jobs, whereas you know under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you have the right to work. Your children have the right to an education. We actually have the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Okay, so we have all these rights. When people say to me, oh, the law's hopeless, you know, we need more laws. No, we don't. We've actually got an incredible framework of common law, God's laws, statute law, European law, international law, and case law. It's actually incredible. They have literally covered every base. But what's going wrong is, as you've all just acknowledged, you're not taught about law in school. So when you leave law school, where do you learn it? Where do any of you go and learn the law? online <laughs> because under the global human rights legislation every state has a duty to teach its citizens about human rights and to make sure they're upheld businesses have a duty to uphold human rights compare and contrast the fact that you guys have told me that you weren't told any of this at school to the fact that if you were a prisoner of war in an enemy concentration camp, you would have a copy of the Geneva Convention to refer to. It's law, but they have to put that in there for you. Right? So if you were in a concentration camp, you'd have a copy. Why haven't you all got a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Why isn't the Human Rights Act up everywhere? Why isn't the Equality Act up everywhere? Because I tell you what, if everybody knew this law, this would not be happening. Because what I'm hearing from everyone is they don't know the law, most of what I'm saying is news to them, and then I'm having to tell people how to go about asserting it. Now that means essentially we're in a lawless society, does it not? Yeah. What's the answer? 
Learn the law. Because at the moment, everyone's saying, where are all the rich lawyers? Why aren't we winning all these law cases? But the truth is, there are lawyers who have been fighting this from the start, and they have been winning cases. So, for example, last August, the Court of Appeal in Portugal ruled that the PCR test was totally unfit for purpose, and it gave 97% false positives. And what is all of these measures being conducted upon? A case demic based on a test which is not fit for purpose. So there's the law being upheld and a decision made, and all the powers that be, and pretty much everyone, is just ignoring it. He did. Kerry Morris, Mullis said, it's not a diagnostic test. Yep, absolutely. And we know that if it's run at 40 to 45 cycles, which is what the NHS and the laboratories here run it on, then you are bound to get a false positive. So the whole of these measures are being placed, you know, based on cases, on a test that is not fit for purpose, that gives a 97% false positive rate. Is that fraud? Yes. <laughs> and is it running a terror campaign? Yes. Okay. So, yes. I've got a question. Um, how much support do you have from the legal profession, even if they're not able to put their heads above the parapet? Well, the, the answer, thank you. The question was, how much support is there from the legal profession, even if they're not able to put their heads above the parapet? And the answer is that there are lawyers working all over the um, world together. So we have several meetings a week, depending on... What, which topics we're talking about and which cases are being run. So, you know, because there are loads of cases, there are judicial reviews of the decision to roll it out to children. Those judicial reviews are being run all over the world. Um, similar kind of obstacles that we're facing in terms of getting the judge to consider the evidence, but they are being run. So we're feeding our evidence into all these cases and affidavits, etc., and legal submissions. Um, and here we've got several teams of lawyers that are working on different things. So we're just launching a judicial review of the MHRA's decision to refuse to acknowledge ivermectin as a successful treatment. Okay, so that judicial review is being run. And the point about that, of course, is if it's based on a, a case demic, then query whether we're in, a, in an emergency. But equally, well, also, if we have effective and safe prophylactic treatment, we do not need to be mandatorily injected, assaulted, with an experimental injection against our will. Now the other battle we have to fight is to get everyone to understand the fact that Pfizer, with the permission of MHRA, has been allowed to keep their trade secrets about all the ingredients 75 in these injections. Years. <laughs> so that means, folks, we're not entitled to know what's going to be put into our body. So, question, how do you provide lawful consent if you don't know all the ingredients in that injection? Can you? No. So what does that mean? That everyone in the country hasn't consented because they don't know what's in the injection? No. See where this is going? This is absolutely horrendous. So that's another legal challenge. Obviously there are cases being won about discrimination claims, people losing their job. The no, no jab, no job policy is completely illegal, unlawful, unethical and immoral. And PHJ Law, I don't know whether you know Philip Island, he acted for Dr. Sam White, he is a legend. Well, you can find his template letter on his website where he talks about you know, being an employee, challenging someone about the no jab, no job. So you can use that template letter, but essentially what he's quoting is all the laws um, to prove that it's actually illegal. And of course what the companies are saying is oh, they have a duty under the health and safety of framework to make a safe workplace. But actually, that's one piece of law. You have to look at that in connection with all the other laws. And Arti uh, Article 6, 1 I think it is, of the Human Rights Act 1998 specifically prohibits a public health authority, and indeed a business, um, from um, derogating from those rights, even in a public health emergency. So I, are there any questions about that process about fighting back for your job?
900,000 pounds, wasn't it, back in 2019 or 18? Yes, conflicts of interest which should be declared. <laughs> Questions that we have raised with our MPs, I know I personally raised it with my MP last August, the conflicts of interest. I was reassured there weren't any. I'm sure you're reassured by that. <laughs> yes. You can't hit the person. No, you can't. Well, now this is a question all the lawyers are asking themselves. Does this exist? Because we're getting evidence from all around the world of freedom of information requests, to come, and the same freedom of information requests have been made here to all kinds of authorities, and they've all come back saying, we haven't got an isolate of it, essentially. However, there are some scientific papers that have been peer-reviewed which claim to have isolated it, so personally, I wouldn't be happy standing here right this minute and saying, it, on my own due diligence, I am absolutely sure it doesn't exist, but we are still looking into that. So if anybody has got any evidence that you want to um, pass through, please do put it on the um... end. <laughs> Um, please can you share it on the Telegram channel, which is the informed consent campaign, because some people seem I'm to be convinced yeah. that it doesn't exist, and therefore the whole thing is just, you know, the Emperor's new clothes, and others think it does. Sorry? Do you, um, do you, want to, you are amazing. Please come here. Please, you are absolutely Right, another point which is that all of these things like the tests and the um, patents were um, uh, uh, submitted way before we even apparently knew this existed. And I don't know whether you've heard the evidence of Dr. David Martin on that yeah. from America. Yeah. He's, and he's happy to work with us uh, lawyers uh, with all of that evidence. It's amazing. Another point over there on my left. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Right, he's booked a hospitality match for over uh, 50,000 people. Sweet, rather. Right. Well, yes, because as I say, you have the absolute right to bodily integrity, the right to life, the right not to be tortured, receive medical treatment, etc. So, unless they actually had a term in the contract, which you were aware of at the time when you booked it, with, in which you said you would submit to any test, then they have no contractual right to make you do that. Well, if I were you, I would try and sort it out with them first. I would write to them, send them the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a starter. <laughs> and send, didn't get a plan. What a lot of these companies are doing, you'll notice, is they're saying their company policy um, applies. And yet, when you challenge them about the fact that their company policy isn't law, and in fact it's breaking the law, they slam the phone down on you, etc. I know because I've tried personally phoning up a load of these companies and challenging them about it. They believe, wrongly, that their company policy overrides the law. It doesn't. <laughs> but unfortunately, as we've identified, we've just got a huge amount of ignorance here about people not knowing the law. And even when you challenge some of the police officers, when I've been on the process in London, and I've asked them to call up the law to quote to me which section they're acting under, they call up the government guidance website. <laughs> and I say to them, that's not the law. And they say, yes, it is. I say, are you a lawyer? They say, no. I say, I am. Senior one. And I promise you, that's not the law. The law is on www.legislation. So can we... Oh, there's a battery gun. <laughs> so can you look it up now, please? And find the section and they can't do it. So you have the police force on the evidence following government guidance. You have businesses following government guidance. 
you've got schools in the NHS, etc., following government guidance. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a few people sitting in House of Parliament dictating effectively to 68 million people and everyone just saying, oh well, government guidance says this, therefore it's law. That's where we're at. So I'll come up with ways to deal with that in a second. So, yes. So for those people who didn't hear it, one of the gentlemen in the crowd said, we seem a bit weak in the UK legally. And people say to me, where are all my colleagues? And I say to them, there are 168,000 lawyers in the UK. I would suggest to you, the public, that you put out an SOS to them. Because I personally have been phoning up the friends I know for the last year and a half, only to be told they're too busy. So here am I. So don't shoot the messenger, because I'm here. Um, but what, what I would share with you is that an awful lot of lawyers are working in law firms where they're required to charge 10 hours a day in order to make seven hours a day profit in order that the partners at the top of the pile are happy. So when those lawyers can't work those 10 hours a day to get their seven hours to get their salary and not get fired, they're already exhausted. Try to try to them to get them to do all this work pro bono and you're looking at a few hours here, there and everywhere. So the lawyers who are on it are the ones who are being crowdfunded. And, you know, there isn't a lot of crowdfunding for all the different cases that we're running. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg at the moment. My wife said to me, everybody should fundraise and pump it into the legal system and then fight it legally because that's our best bet. Well, what we should be doing, of course, is, is getting some... Um, under the Global Human Rights Sanctions Regulations, the uh, state has the right to sanction those who are in breach of our, our human rights. And that includes stripping their assets and not letting them travel, etc. So one of the things that us lawyers are talking about is how we create a compensation fund so that it's worth people investing into a crowd fund to claim their damages from all the harm that's been caused out of a pot of money. But, you know, at the moment we've got a situation where everyone needs a lawyer. There aren't enough lawyers. People can't afford a lawyer. So you're going to have to learn the law yourself. What we are doing is creating templates. So I've got here, you can have a look with me, I've got a notice of liability. It's at the moment, this one's for teachers, because our focus this term has been on stopping the children being injected without their consent. But we've also done, drafted an affidavit. Now what we're inviting people to do is, as in your community, identify who the people are who are breaking the law. Who are the councillors who are closing down the businesses? Who are the teachers who are, inject, who are masking the children, etc.? Okay, so you need to find out who's perpetrating, who's aiding and abetting, and who's complicit, and serve them with a notice of liability and your supporting affidavit, which again, I've got a template here for. And you serve those documents on the person, and you serve a copy on the police. And the point about doing that is, I don't know if you know, or you probably heard me already, the um, murder charge that's been launched in India. Yeah. The, the defendants are Bill Gates, but also the local police, because people were flooding the police with affidavit evidence, and the police weren't investigating. So what we'd like everyone to do is tell their own story in their affidavit, even if you don't want to serve a notice of liability on anyone, but you want the police to investigate your story, please serve them with your affidavit evidence. Because if we can flood the police around the station, around the country, and our MPs with that affidavit evidence, I'm pretty sure we will be showing that we are not complying. What do you think? Yes. Are you prepared to do that? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Oh, wonderful, well, I've got the documents so we can talk after. Is there anything else you'd like me to update you on? Yes, Stephen. Just, um, your uh, organisation, website, can you tell me what it is so they need to donate to it? Right, well we've got several um, up websites up and running depending on what you want to do. The informed consent campaign is on Telegram and we have got a website but it's not quite launched yet. 
and that's for anybody and everybody to um, share information, templates, pro formas, etc. about the whole issue and law of informed consent. But we also have veteransforpurpose.org.uk and that's not just for military veterans, it's for you know medical veterans, it's for teaching veterans, it's basically for veterans, um, to invite you to get involved with helping our local communities with some of the issues that they're facing. So we invite you to look on that website. There's also forourkids.org.uk and that's because I don't know how many of you know, but whilst we're all running around like headless chickens over COVID, which how many children have died? It's something like nine children last year. It was something incredibly small, thank goodness. But unfortunately, the figures show that 112,000 children from the UK go missing every year in child trafficking. 112,000. That's the real pandemic. That's the real crime. This is all smoke and mirrors. So forourkids.org.uk is for people who want to get involved in actually fighting back for our children, not just with these injections, but about trafficking, about any kind of abuse. So, you know, it's, it depends where you want to put your time and your energy and your focus, really. But those are the three websites that you can help with. If any of you also want to get involved with the World Council for Health, I'm on the steering committee for that. And that's an organization that we're, we're trying to bring in all the world experts so that every week we can have these Zoom calls where the experts give our ev their evidence and we lawyers talk about the next steps. And for example, we have Git van den Bosch, the number one yeah. expert yeah. in the world. We so like I've him. personally taken Git's evidence. Lovely man. He can spend, he's spending hours wanting to help people. Yeah. Um, Robert Malone, Peter McCulloch, Tess Laurie, Tess and I are on the steering committee together. So we've got world experts now working together for free, bless their hearts, with all the lawyers to try and help you guys. So I really hope you take comfort from that because even though you might not be hearing about cases here, they are being run around the world and of course they then become binding on our jurisdiction even if we haven't won, run them personally. Sorry? At what point can we bring these criminals to justice was the question. Well, this is the next stage. The next stage is to ask the police to investigate. We've already asked them several times. Apparently they haven't had enough evidence. So this is what I'm saying to you guys. We need to flood them because the International Criminal Court has accepted the UK's application. Okay, there's been two applications now. One made by a team in April and another made by a team on the 6th of December been acknowledged by the, the ICC. So if the ICC decides to come in and investigate, then obviously we'll be starting the process to take it to the International Criminal Court. But we're not waiting for the ICC to investigate. We're doing our own evidence gathering and our own investigations, but we need to submit that evidence to the police. And the beauty about the affidavit is it's a legal document that can be used in court at a later date and relied on. So when the ICC do come in, we can show them hundreds of thousands of millions of affidavits. So I hope that makes sense. Yes. Do you think it does? Yes. yes. Yeah. We, we are working with Rhino Filmic and um, what we, as I say, what we lawyers are doing is sending each other our submissions and our key bits of evidence. Um, Rhino's work is very, very helpful in that he's representing Dr. Bodark. Um, challenging about the PCR test, etc., and all that fraud. Um, but he's obviously also preparing for, for Nuremberg too. Um, a lot of his submissions are very specific to Germany, so we have to make our own, and each lawyers are having to make their own for their own jurisdiction. But yes, and we're working with Rocco Gelati, and we're working with um, you know legend lawyers from all over the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank all of them. When I speak to them, I'll say you all got a clap. <laughs> Sorry, there was somebody else. No, it's just there's lots of small legal cases going on. Do you think that's going to gain momentum and it's going to get bigger? Is it not? People have spoken about you and about two. I've been watching Brian and Fulman for about. 12, 14 months. Yeah. When's it going to happen? Well, people ask, me, people ask me what Reiner's doing. I haven't directly asked Reiner this question, and I'm not inside his head. 
but I fully suspect that Reiner's doing what is Reiner's doing what I'm doing and what other lawyers are doing, which is to put our evidence and the law out for you and to use the court of public opinion. Because ultimately it's you guys who need to hear the evidence and it's you who need to hear the legal analysis and work out what's going on. Obviously we can take that and put all of that in front of a couple of judges, but you're the judges. It's a big stuff in America, isn't it, right now? Against the federal government and they go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Well, let's face it, the American lawyers need to sort out their own problems, don't they? We've got Pfizer that's an American company manufacturing something in Germany. We've got the NIAD now confirming they own Moderna, all American companies. And we've got Fauci, you know, being the, uh, what's it, Pied Piper. And, you know, so that's all American. So, yes, the American lawyers need to sort their own well I, I as I understand it it's something like a hundred and twenty thousand NHS workers well should we all just take a minute there that's a hundred and twenty thousand medical staff who don't who would rather lose their job than be injected. Would you rather listen to them or to the celebrities or the MPs or anyone else telling you it's perfectly safe? I know who I'm listening to. So yeah, the medics need to get together essentially because if you're one or two pe people in every trust, you're going to be picked off. So you need to get together. I know there's a telegram. No, what you need to do is each and every one of you insist that you're given an individual risk assessment under the health and safety laws. Right? Via the occupational health physician, not a line manager, not anyone who's not qualified, you need to be taken through by a physician a full individual clinical risk assessment. Now, Well, they want to do it by February. By the time they get you into an appointment, get the results and you talk about it all, have any allergy tests that you need to have, and to be given an absolutely clean bill of health where they swear to you it won't harm you, right? So you've got a little bit of time. Start the ball rolling now, because I know it normally takes you about a month to set up occupational health appointments. So you get an occupational health appointment, they will have to, under the law, take you through a full risk assessment, where they have to give you the material risks, which means they'll have to show you all the adverse events on the... Um, reporting system, the yellow card reporting system, and it has to be an individual benefit to you, not for anyone else, so to you. No, this isn't a game. This is a potentially criminal act of assault, right? So it's not a game at all, and your life is in threat. Your life is threatened. No, but the thing is, they have a legal statutory duty. Your employer has a legal statutory duty to provide you with an individual risk assessment. Okay, this isn't an option. It's not a discretion. And if they break it, it's potentially imprisonable because you could die. Okay. Act now. Start no, now. Act now. Start Act now. Act now. All of you, anyone who's anybody in any employment who's being told that there may be a mandate, ask, you know, insist that your employer upholds their legal statutory duty to provide you with a proper individual risk assessment. That's the law. The best form of that is the law. Attack. I take it the same would apply for mandate and testing. Yeah, like it's exactly yeah. the same. The testing, the masking, anything that is breaching your um, psychiatric or physical integrity without your consent is unlawful. Therefore, by definition, a mandate is unlawful. It's coercion. And I've just read the case of Harani Hanarani that says coercion vitiates consent. So, you know, none of this is legal. The reason it's happening is because we've established nobody knows the law.
Hannah, yeah. is there anything you can do or you can advise us on the fact that the data is being, you're being lied to and the data is being manipulated in terms of <laughs> if you've been double vaccinated or however many times, if you die or have an adverse reaction um, within a period up, up after 28 days. I, th I think it's 14, is it not 14 days? You're not past so, so many days, you count as your second injection. Yeah, okay. the question here, the question here, which I'm sure you, you're all aware of, is the changing goalposts about who is unvaccinated, who's vaccinated, how many days after a vaccine you're still unvaccinated, etc. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. So essentially the question is, how do we deal with the fact that we're being lied to and defrauded by the statistics? Well, I'm no statistician, but I know there's people like Joel Smalley in the health advisory research team, who's a brilliant statistician, and he's often sending letters to the government, etc., challenging them about that. But what I would say is, you know, this is a community team effort. We'd so like if to there are him. some brilliant statisticians out there who would actually like to present the public the truth of the figures, then that would, and the lawyers, of course, that would be enormously helpful. What, what's his name again? Um, Joel Smalley. Joel Smalley. Um, but Mike, Mark Oakford has also done an amazing, shout out to Mark. Mark Oakford has done an incredible job on looking at the care home deaths, for example, oh. and the deaths related to midazolam and morphine, and they do not resuscitate. So there are, I know there are, you know, our community experts on these things, but yes, you're quite right, the, the figures are being manipulated. Anything else? Can I just ask, um, oh. you know, people that do their research, we've been also hearing about the Great Research and the World Economic Forum. What do you think their influence on this is? Do you think the end game is depopulation? So the question is, um, what do I think about the um, great, great Research, the World Economic Forum, um, and is there a depopulation program? Um, so yes, there is something called the Great Reset. For those who are in any doubt whatsoever, go onto the World Economic Forum website itself and you'll find loads of information there about how they're planning to reset our economy and essentially put us all into an entirely different debt and economic system. And according to Klaus Schwab, the author of The Great Reset, who incidentally, his father was a eugenicist, and his father used to make machinery for the Third Reich war machinery. So anyway, that chap, he says, we'll all own nothing and be happy by 2030. So, do you like that idea? <laughs> and have you consented? No. And we're governed by consent. So what on earth is some Swiss guy doing, dictating to the United Kingdom sovereign nation how our economy is going to be, etc.? And, and when this happened, Prince William was on the news and he was telling, saying, oh, everyone needs to stop being obsessed with materialism. <laughs> Right, that's Prince William saying everyone should stop being obsessed with materialism. And where did the Queen give her Christmas Day speech? In front of a gold piano, I seem to recall. So, yeah, um, under the Magna Carta, we cannot be deceased of our freehold property. So Klaus Schwab might do what he likes over there, but in this country, it's illegal, Klaus. Okay, so, and in terms of the sustainable agendas, and depopulation, what we do know is that United Nations Agenda 2020 and 2030, these are not conspiracy theories. Again, you go onto the United Nations website, you Google those agendas, you can download them, PDF form and read through them. And of course, what we know is that the eugenicists are saying that we all need to die because we're useless eaters and we're ruining their planet. But what I find fascinating about that is that nobody lines up and says, I'm going first, I'm a eugenicist, and I'm going to walk the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we better, I think we better wrap up, haven't we? Everyone's getting wet. Is there anything else? Do you want to say something? I want to put a call out to the vets before I go. Yay! If there are any vets listening, first of all, those who have stood up, thank, thank you. you. Big thank round you. Of And um, yeah, the vets are running lots of missions behind the scenes, so helping out communities, uh, which is really wonderful. But we need more of you to stand up, please. The public are calling out the lawyers and the veterans, and they're saying, where are you all? So please, come and join us.
come and help the public. They're sending out an SOS. And in fact, an SOS was sent out about two months ago, an open letter to all British military serving and retired. So you have no excuse not to have read that SOS. And indeed, more ones have been put out since then. So please show up, please comply with your duty, take action. Omitting to act is not an option. I agree. Okay, so thank you all. Oh, Stephen, say one last thing. Oh, um, it, Stephen's asked me to talk about the police and criminal justice. To be totally, yeah. To be totally honest, I have to confess I haven't yet properly looked into that, so I can't talk about that at the moment. But maybe when I come back in January, I will. Um, to be honest, my focus has been trying to stop the children being jabbed over the last three months. Oh, I don't know. But as I say, we're governed by consent. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't consent, then I'm not sure whether Plan Z 53 matters. You know, frankly. So because mass non-compliance with this is actually one of the only ways we're going to get through this. And given that all these measures are illegal, unlawful, unethical and immoral and are causing you harm, why would you comply with them anyway? Yes, your brain washed. Yes, your brain washed. All right. So, thank, well, thank you. you all very, very much for listening. Thank you. 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 Thank you.